Hello everyone, this is Jenny Lyle and welcome to Out of My Mind. Today we're going to talk about the shark cage metaphor, which is a way of looking at domestic violence from a new angle so that we're not looking at the behavior of the victim as much as we are looking at the behavior of the offender. I got the information in this particular video from Psycho Psychotherapy in Australia, Volume 17, Number 2, February 2011, and the author is named Ursula Benstead. So occasionally I'm going to use Australian vernacular. I am not going to attempt an Australian accent. That would be ridiculous. Uh, the other thing I'm going to do while I'm talking to you guys today is work on my bullet journal, which is overdue because we are at the 1st of May already. So you're going to see me working on this while I talk to you. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about a couple of young ladies. Their names are Sally and Chantel. These ladies are straight out of Ms. Barnstead's or perhaps Dr. Benstead's uh, article. And Sally and Chantel are at a pub because, of course, we are in Australia, so they have pubs more than bars, although I think they have bars there too. And they're at different ends of this pub, and so they can't easily see each other and see the things that are happening to each other. And besides, they don't know each other. They just happen to be in the same bar. Well, a shark comes in, and he starts circling the room looking for victims, as sharks do. Whoops, I can't read that Sunday anymore. Looks like I won't be able to use that one for highlighting. And he sees Sally, and he walks up to her, and he looks at the bartender, and he says, Midorian water for the pretty lady. Or maybe Midorian line, but he says something like that. And then he puts his arm around her and puts his hand on her bum, because that's what they call it in Australia, and looks at her and says, you got a great set of tits. How about you and me go out to dinner tonight and then I am going to take you home and we can Netflix and chill. Right? Well, the same guy does the same routine with Chantel. Well, let's talk first about Sally's reaction to this. Sally has a really good shark cage. She has alarms all over it. The bars are strong. They're made of valerian steel, you all, with maybe a bit of dragon glass. Okay. Super strong shark cage. And... Sally isn't having any of these. So she removes his arm from around her and tells him to get lost. And of course he fusses and throws up a fight and says, what, what did I do? I didn't do anything. What the hell's wrong with you, you B-I-T-C-H? You know how guys do when they get told to go wander off. And uh, the reason Sally did that is because Sally noticed right off that there were six, count them, six boundary crossings in that very short amount of time that she made the acquaintance of Mr. Shark. The first was that he assumed she wanted her to drink. He had no idea what she was drinking. For all he knew, she was drinking water, and yet he ordered for her anyway, which leads to the second one. He decided what she was going to drink. He didn't ask. He just decided that this was the drink that he wanted her to have. The third thing was he did was to touch her without her consent. And let's expand that to the fourth thing. He touched her sexually without her consent. Then he objectified her and sexualized her body by talking about her tits. Finally, he decided where they were going to go for the evening without consulting her wishes, without even asking her wishes. So this is a gentleman, and we use that term loosely, 
who has no interest in Sally as a person, who is there simply as a shark circling the room looking for victims. Now, it's an open question whether he's looking for sexual partners for the night or he's looking for somebody that he can sexually dominate in the future. In either case, he is not a healthy guy to go home with in most cases. Now, Chantel has a terrible shark cage. Remember, we're not born with shark cages. We learn them when we have parents who help us keep our boundaries, who teach us about consent, who help us to believe in ourselves and believe in our right to say yes and no. So Chantel didn't have the advantages that Sally had. So when uh, Mr. Shark does the exact same thing to her, because remember, she can't see Sally, so she doesn't know this is a routine he does, right? So Mr. Shark does the same routine on Chantel, and Chantel is thinking, mm, well, he's offering to buy me dinner, and he did buy me a drink, and he seems to be interested in me, so okay, you know. So she agrees to have a drink with him, and then to go with him to a steakhouse and have dinner, and then go back to his place. And like as not, they probably had very unsatisfying sex that she didn't particularly want. I am not calling this rape. I am calling it that situation that women get into sometimes, and you probably know what I'm talking about, where you feel like you are obligated and so you give in, but it wasn't something that was your idea, okay? And before long, Mr. Shark shows up because he's a shark to his roommate too because people who do stuff like this are often people who have these patterns again and again and again in their lives. So people who do things like this are going to have a pattern of being obnoxious to other people and therefore their relationships are usually in a bit of a disaster state. So Mr. Shark has gotten kicked out of his place by his roommate because he's obnoxious and he shows up on Chantel's doorstep and uh, she's thinking, ah, oh, I'll let him stay overnight. You know, what can that hurt? He seems like a nice guy and he's in a bad situation. I guess I'm gonna help him, right? Because we're nice people. That's what we were trained to be, right? So he spends the night and he spends the week and he spends, <sighs> before long, he tells her, I don't like wearing a condom. Condoms are like wearing a raincoat in the rain or a raincoat in the shower. And so he refuses to wear a condom and before long, Chantel's pregnant and not Far after that, she's trying to give her attention to uh, this new situation in her life because, you know, regardless of everything else, she's always wanted a baby. And uh, that's when the beatings begin. And in fact, it's pretty common for beatings to begin during a pregnancy. So that's the basic story from the shark cage metaphor. We get a lot of things from that. First of all, we get that it wasn't the abuser's actions that led to Chantel becoming abused, becoming his victim, I should say. It's the fact that she didn't know how to handle his actions because of her broken shark cage. Um, Sally had had a lot of preparation in, if a man doesn't love you for you, don't go with him. She had a lot of preparation and you're valuable. If a man isn't better than being alone, don't go with him. She had a lot of preparation in simply appreciating who she is and her own company. Remember, sharks don't pick you, they test cages. If Chantel had done the exact same thing Sally did, he would have gone on and on and on until he found a different Chantel to uh, go home with that night because that was his goal and he has found that if he bumps against enough, enough shark cages with that exact same routine that eventually he will find somebody who will go home with him. 
So, to build a better shark cage so you don't end up like poor Chantel in a bad situation with a guy who isn't worth being a baby daddy, one of the things you need to do is very early when you first meet anyone, establish strong boundaries. Let's go back to those six boundary crossings. Don't let somebody order a drink for you. Don't let somebody touch you without your permission ahead of time. Don't let, um, don't let somebody who talks about you sexually upon meeting you go any further in your life. That person is a kill in the Mary Shag kill relationship metaphor from a couple weeks ago. You want that person out of your life and you want them out of your life right now because they are dangerous to you. Um, if you are starting to date somebody, if you are out of the pub and have met somebody at a coffee shop or through a friend or some other way and you want to ensure that this relationship is going to go well, let's look at some warning signs of um, people who are sharks. Um, remember, we're focusing on the behavior of the shark here, not on the behavior of the person who is trying to build their shark cage. Um, Sharks will often be very jealous and possessive very early. This isn't just sexual jealousy and possession. This is also jealousy and possessiveness over your time with friends and family. They may object to you spending time with any children that you have, with your parents, with work buddies, with uh, best friends, uh, with friends on Facebook or Twitter, even with your work. Um, if I'd had a good shark cage on my first marriage, my first clue would have been that my ex-husband used to get very, very upset when I would start writing, and he would do just about anything to distract me from writing. And that should have been a clue for me, but I had a very poor shark cage, and I wasn't able to spot that one. Another one is love bombing. Very early in the relationship, oh, Mr. Shark comes on strong. He's so helpful around the house. He brings you flower every day. He says the L word five minutes into the relationship. He is in love with you. And he wants to treat you like the queen and no man has ever treated you better and all of that. Now, if you find that you are very early in a relationship and you can't breathe, hello, Scout, are you going to come on camera this time? No, it doesn't look like it. Um, then it's probably a good idea to back out quickly from this relationship because it is a good bet. Oops, that's the wrong one. It is a good bet that this guy is doing what's called love bombing. He is trying to get you addicted to that feeling of being pampered and spoiled and treated that way so that you will keep seeking that fix when that fix stops coming because a lot of the things that cause us to stay in abusive relationships are related chemically to the same things that cost us to be addicted to things like gambling and drugs because we get a high from the good feelings that allows us to put up with the bad feelings, if that gives you a good idea. All right. Next is if that person fights it when you set a boundary. Let's say you're really early in the relationship and you say, every Tuesday night I have a knitting group with my friends and I can't date on Tuesday nights. And this guy, or girl, because you know, uh, domestic violence is not gendered entirely, although more men are domestic violence perpetrators and more women are domestic violence victims and the other way around. It does happen in same-sex relationships as well as straight relationships and in all kinds of relationships. Anyhow, so if he's fighting your boundaries, if he is saying, well, you know, I really want to spend Tuesday nights with you. It's really not fair that you always want to spend Tuesday nights with your friends over and over every single time that this becomes a bone of contention. Um, that's a problem. You know, if he were to say just once, you know, I'd really like to do this one special thing on your special night, you know, that's kind of normal. But if it becomes a thing, that's a problem. Also, if you set a boundary 
and every time you set a boundary, you get a fight or you get this dramatic, oh, I'll never talk about that situation again because you don't like it. That is boundary crossing. There is a phrase that we use in mental health to discuss people's boundary crossing that's called DARVO, D-A-R-V-O. And it is a, an acronym that tells how an abuser goes about convincing you that you have to keep doing what he wants you to do. He will deny that he's abusing. He will accuse you of abusing. And he will reverse the roles of victim and offender. He will say, no, I'm the victim here. You don't treat me right. You don't cook my dinners for me every night. If you would only do X, Y, Z, I wouldn't have to hurt you. Um, and if that person that you are starting to date does not start seeking affirmative consent, affirmative consent is when they ask for things ahead of time. Like, hey, do you have time on Tuesday to go out with me? Or, hey, is it okay if we go to the next step in this relationship, rather than this jumping the boundary? If this person, when you're cuddling, continually tries to turn that touch into sexual touch, this is a big, big warning sign. Um, so keep watching for that affirmative consent stuff. Remember, it's not your fault if you fall victim to one of these sharks because we are not born with shark cages. And this is Memorial Day. I'm sorry, I'm writing this down for this month. And it's also my mother's birthday. Um, and my mother has been dead since 1999, but I always uh, mourn her, especially on her birthday. Um, somebody who is a shark is hunting you skillfully. They know what they're doing. They have done this before. And this is Mother's Day. And then on my last day, they're going to hunt you using skills that they've practiced over and over again. And they're going to get better and better at this. And there are actual websites and whole areas of the web where men especially go to learn how to gaslight and abuse women and get away with it. Now, you're thinking, but, you know, the guy that I thought might be loving, love bonding me, I mean, he's been doing this for six months. He's got to be one of the good ones, right? Here's something to keep in mind. Uh, there was once a uh, man who worked in uh, one of those court-mandated uh, sexual assault, or no, I'm sorry, it was a domestic violence group. And uh, this is a piece that I read somewhere, and if anybody can find the source for me, that would be great. Um, this gentleman decided one day, when he didn't have material prepared for whatever reason, I'm just going to show my notes for the rest of the time, because guess what, guys? I don't have anything else to do with my hands. Um, this guy found, when he sat down and talked with these guys, the first thing he says is, so, do you start abusing the person you're with the day you meet them? And these guys who claim that they aren't planning this are all start talking over each other at once. And this guy was really startled at what they said. He said, oh, no, no, no. First, you have to get them interested. First, you have to lure them in. First, you have to get them addicted to you. You can't start that stuff until they are you know, totally hooked on you. It can take up to two years to get you on the hook. And there are domestic violence offenders that will wait that long. Some will wait until after you've got the ring on your finger. Some will wait until they feel like you can't escape. They will slowly but surely erode your support. They'll erode your self-confidence. And then the physical abuse won't start until you are already been mentally abused. There's another metaphor that comes in here. It's called boiling the frog. You put the frog in cold water and then you heat it up with hot water a little bit at a time. Just keep turning it up and turning it up and turning it up. And the dog, supposedly, according to the metaphor, the frog won't jump out of the water and will die of boiling to death. So, 
keep in mind, again, it's not your fault. He is hunting you skillfully. You weren't born with the scar uh, shark cage, but shark cages can be learned. You can learn how to build strong boundaries. Decide what you want in a relationship before you go on the first date and check that person off against your list. And if they aren't meeting your list, move on. Um, they're going to keep testing shark cages. Some might come back and test you again and again and again. If your cage is strong, they're going to move on. Set those boundaries. Watch for jealous and possessive behavior. Watch for love bombing. When you set a boundary, watch for them to uh, reverse the victim and, defend, and, and offender. A good example would be if you say, you know, I've done the dishes every night for a week. It's your turn. And they start screaming about all the things they've ever done um, that have helped around the house. And that's not the point. The point is the dishes. And they start telling you that you aren't good enough at doing this and you're not good enough at doing that. So they don't see why should they should do the dishes. And they make it all about you. And you have troubles figuring out that's what they're doing. Um, because you're very emotional at this point and you're thinking, you know, I thought it was a reasonable request, but maybe I'm wrong. It was a reasonable request and they are crossing your boundaries. Um, beware of those who don't seek affirmative consent. You know, people who tickle without your permission, people who touch you without your permission, people who tell jokes after you've said, I don't like that particular kind of joke. Um, things like that. People who don't seek consent are people who are going to not value consent. Okay, guys, it's time to close this up right now. Thank you so much for listening and watching, and I will talk to you next week. Remember that if you want to see this video, go to the Out of My Mind video channel on YouTube, go to oomm.live, or go to patreon.com backslash J-L-I-L-E-S if you can't wait the three whole days it takes for me to make things public. Because, hey, I need to eat too, and a Buck is all it costs to support me. Thank you very, very much. Bye. Hi guys, this is Jenny Lyles. Thank you for watching my video. I'd like to talk to you for a moment about my best friend, Kathy Malone. Kathy has a heart condition that she contracted from a virus when she was in her 20s. She's 17 years past her expiration date. And Kathy will die if she doesn't get a heart transplant, and it needs to happen within the next year or two. Unfortunately, she has been told by the hospital where she will be getting the transplant that she needs to come up with a minimum of $20,000 in order to prove that she can pay for her anti-rejection meds over the first 18 months after her transplant, or they won't put her on the list. I'm trying to save my best friend's life. If you would like to help me with that, please go to forkathysheart.responsivellc.com and click on the links on the right-hand side if you're on a desktop or towards the bottom if you are on a mobile phone and please donate to her GoFundMe or to her PayPal so that my best friend's life can be saved. Thank you.